good stuff and it's impressive. I'm glad we got to connect here. Getting back to what you said about reading the tea leaves, just being able to, you know, go high level and look at the macro. I'd like to talk broadly of what, you know, the state of things are right now. You know, in some of the research, you talk about business cycles, and this is really big, longer term things that some people may have a hard time wrapping their head around. Uh, but then there's also things that are topical that are happening week to week, month to month in terms of data and numbers that's coming out. So I'll just kind of let you open riff on the state of things uh, as you see them. And then we'll, I've got a list here of things we can dive into all the specifics of, uh, of, you know, of what you're paying attention to, but, uh, but I'll let you start it, start out with just kind of high level. Uh, what are you watching? Sure. So first of all, thank you for the kind words. I would say if I were to describe where we are in the business cycle, uh, we're probably toward the seventh or eighth inning. And actually maybe I'll, maybe I'll take a step back and sort of define how I think about the business cycle, because I think that'll help put everything, uh, everything that I say going forward into context. So where does the business cycle really start for us? Well, in this case, it's probably useful to rewind the clock to call it late 2021. What was going on? Inflation was running a little bit hot. The Fed was starting to realize that it had made a policy mistake in letting inflation run too hot for too long. So what did the Fed do? The Fed raised interest rates or started to communicate that it was going to raise interest rates. What happens when they do that? Well, the entire U.S. interest rate complex starts to move higher. And we're going to focus on the 30-year fixed mortgage rate for the, the purposes of this conversation because that ends up being a really important rate. And, you know, a lot of people might think, well, the Fed doesn't really doesn't really, you know, control the 30 year fixed mortgage rate. So why does that matter? The reality is the Fed funds rate is the policy rate and the Fed funds rate moves pretty much everything else. Right. So if you ran a regression of the Fed funds rate and the mortgage rate, there's a, a 91 percent correlation between the two. So when the when the when mortgage rates are going up, you can almost always blame the Fed. That's almost always the reason it's going higher or lower. In this case, going higher. Right. So when mortgage rates move higher, what happens to demand for housing? Uh, well, it goes down, right? Because mortgages become more expensive. When mortgages become more expensive, fewer people can afford them. And it's it's really not any more complicated than that. The impact on demand for, for mortgages is near instantaneous. And this cycle, we've seen about a 56% decline. Well, actually, it was a 60% peak to trough decline from uh, early 2021 until I think it was October when demand for new mortgages uh, troughed, but it's still down about 56% off of its peak. So you've seen demand for, for housing or for mortgage financed housing just absolutely fall off a cliff as mortgage rates have gone from sub 3% to, uh, to uh, you know around 7% right now. So what happens after housing, well, with after mortgage apps become, uh, excuse me, after mortgage rates become so, uh, so expensive? Well, new home sales fall, right? So a lot of people have been looking at the new home sales data and saying, well, oh, maybe it's picking back up again. That's that's not really the complete picture. Really, the statistic that you want to be looking at for the quote unquote health of the housing market is total home sales, because only about 15 percent of total home sales are new homes. Eighty five percent are existing homes. Right. And inventories are very, very low in existing homes, which is squeezing activity into new homes. Right. If I were to go out and buy a house today, it would be much easier for me to buy a new home than an existing home. So that dynamic is benefiting home builders and new home sales and any measure of new home sales, right? So the NAHB index is at a multi-month high. And the reason, but the reason for that is it's a measure of home builder sentiment, right? So again, home builders are benefiting from this dynamic also, hence why the stocks have done so well. But in any case, total home sales are still down quite a bit. They're down about 37% from their peak. And maybe they've stabilized a little bit over the last few months, but, but they're still pretty low, right? The reason that matters is because Really, the housing cycle drives the good cycle, particularly the durable good cycle. And so what I'm talking about there is cars, washing machines, uh, furniture, uh, big, expensive, financeable, discretionary items that really drive the manufacturing cycle. So when new orders for durable goods go down, manufacturing companies respond by cutting production, right? That's the, the natural response to less demand for their goods. Now, manufacturing companies can only cut production for so long before it starts to eat into their margins. And so uh, after that, what do they do? Well, they have to lay people off. I say we're in the seventh or eighth inning of this process because we actually have started to see some layoffs in manufacturing. So we've seen, uh, if you look at the last employment situation report, manufacturing payrolls are about 2,000 net layoffs in July. If you look at the ADP data, it was much worse. So the ADP data is generally considered a little bit less reliable, but um, they would have to be wrong by a lot for this data to not be meaningful. So we saw 36,000 net layoffs in July. And if you look back over the last 
five months, it's been almost 200,000 net layoffs in manufacturing. So I say net layoffs, meaning net of new hiring. So the reality is, you know, in certain in certain parts of the manufacturing economy, it's probably been even worse than that. So from manufacturing, if this is going to become a recession, that weakness in manufacturing will metastasize into the broader economy, right? Because as, as layoffs increase, theoretically, as, as the unemployment rate increases, which we haven't seen at the headline level yet, uh, incomes will go down, incomes go down, consumptions go down, uh, consumption not just of goods, but also of services. And that's how you get weakness in the services sector as well. So again, seventh or eighth inning of that process, that's where we are today. Hopefully that was helpful. Thank you.